All right, back in 2016, a Marine combat veteran battling PTSD and looking to reclaim his life after a suicide attempt landed him in the hospital. John Hancock walked nearly 6,000 miles around the country visiting Gold Star families, those who had lost a, a fellow Marine, one of his fellow Marines in combat. He ended that journey in grand fashion at Camp Pendleton in Southern California. Marines stood at attention every 50 feet for a mile as John completed the last steps of his walk with hundreds of people behind him. John Hancock's advocacy and stre advocacy strengthened since after the walk with the formation of his nonprofit Bastards Road Project. He's been featured on national interviews in Forbes.com, CNN, Cheddar, Military.com, as well as across the country in the OC Register, Florida Today, and Baltimore Sun, among others. His remarkable honesty, insight, and humor encourage strength to face down trauma and self-loathing, depression, and isolation that follows it. The documentary feature film, Bastards Road, directed by Brian Morrison, who also lensed and produced the film, Chronicling John's epic walk is the winner of seven festivals in 2020 and truly a journey of the heart and soul across our country. The feature film documentary, Bastards Road, is being released by Gravitas Ventures, a Red Arrow Studios company across all TVOD digital platforms, iTunes, Amazon, Fandango Now, YouTube, Voodoo, Google Play, etc., and DVD throughout North America continent, and is available now leading through Memorial Day with an international expansion planned for later this year. John, welcome to the show. Hey, hey, thanks, brother. Thanks for having me, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super honored to be here. I'm sorry we couldn't do it earlier. Absolutely. So, we're going to get to talking about what happened on your six thousand mile journey. By the way, how long did it take you to walk six thousand miles? It's, uh, it started September 11th, of 2015, at 1:15 in the morning. Ended December 12th, of 2016. So that roughs out at one year, three months, and a day. <laughs> wow that's quite a hump you know yeah, it, was a, it was a long one <laughs> okay so take us back a little bit while well, you're in the marine corps tell us a little bit about what you did in the marine corps getting out and eventually what led up to all this sure so i i joined the marine corps right out of high school and i graduated high school in may of 2001 by june of 2001 i'm in paris island uh, I graduate September 7th of 2001, four days later, the entire world changes. Uh, I'm, and then I head to School of Infantry. And then after School of Infantry, I head over to 2nd Time 4th Marines, and uh, I'm going to be part of the 5th Marine Regiment. And so I had no idea what 2-4 was. I had, uh, uh, I had no, no idea of their, their history and their, their luster. Uh, and so I, I check in there, and, you know, we start training. Uh, we go to Okinawa, we get stop, loss, stop, move for the OIF-1 push into Baghdad. So, you know, all of a sudden, 2-4 has this name called 2-4 No War. And because uh, everybody else in, in the Marine Corps was fighting except for a few units, and we were one of those units. Uh, and I'll always say combat is a lottery. And, you know, everyone that says they want to go, yeah, that's fine. I get that. And you want to do your job, uh, but you don't get to choose when you go. And so then... Uh, we come back and then we start training again. And then uh, towards the end of 2003, we start learning that we're going to Iraq. Um, we're going to a town, to a city called Ramadi. And we had never heard of this city before. Uh, it's the provincial capital of the Al Anbar province, uh, which is the only, uh, it's the only uh, Sunni province in Iraq. And so we were heading there into the new year. Well, we get there in you know February of 2004, and uh, everything kind of looks okay, and we're doing these SASO operations, you know, stability and support operations. So we're walking around asking, uh, asking locals, you know, hey, do you guys have any water? Oh, what's your electricity like? You know, and everything's kind of. I thought that was what the deployment was going to be, right. uh, and then everything kind of changed right around March 19th, March 22nd. We had our first casualty. Uh, PFC Dang was hit by an RPG, and then uh, after that, uh, April 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, would become known as the Battle of Ramadi, where the entire city just fell down around us. Uh, we would end up losing 11 guys on the first day from Golf Company, and then Echo Company would take the brunt of those casualties, losing uh, another 20 or so over the course of the next uh, you know, two or three months. And so all in all, in that deployment, we ended up losing 34, or 34 men. It was 33 Marines and one Navy corpsman. 
uh, and then following that, I left, uh, came back home, and uh, had discovered counterintelligence, human intelligence. So I re-enlisted, laterally moved, and went over to Counter Intel and stayed there for uh, roughly five years, uh, getting out at the end of 2009, and then uh, rolling right into University of Maryland, where I double majored in Arabic and Russian. I was already two weeks late for class. I was, I was still conducting combat operations when classes started. Uh, so it was, it was a real fish out of water experience and I was thrust directly into it. There was no, there was no, you know, uh, leave time, if you will. There was no, you know, like decompression time. Yeah. Talk about and it. It was just right in. It was from one thing right to another. Well, this other was really the beast of the entire thing. Combat's easy. Uh, assimilating back into society is difficult, especially when it's, uh, especially when it's students and every single one of them has their own opinion about you and about what's going on and they have no basis for their opinion other than what they see on the news or watch or hear uh so they have they have you know no grounds for anything they think they just think it but they're also dumb teenagers that are just rolling into college so you got to give them a little bit of a break yep. uh that started to wear on me and i couldn't deal with all of it anymore and so i stopped going to class and i started drinking heavily and uh, while I was drinking more and more, I was going to class less and less. And then one day I, uh, I drove home from the bar uh, and got a DUI. And after that first one, uh, there was probably a year to the day of, uh, for the second one, almost. Uh, and uh, after that second one, there was a suicide attempt. Uh, and I'll never understand why the cop dropped me off at home versus arresting me. Uh, I'll, I'll never get that. But that was probably one of the most saving graces things that's happened to me. Because uh, had I been in, uh, had I been thrust into the into the prison system for you know four or five months, who knows where I'd be right now? Um, but I didn't, and I went home, and instead I decided I'd empty pills from my medicine cabinet into my stomach. Well, as I was doing that, these pills were taking hold, and uh, the stomach starts cramping, and you realize that what you're doing now is you're effectively dying. And I didn't want to do that, and so I hopped in the car. Uh, I drove from while still drunk. Uh, from my house in College Park, Maryland to the Baltimore VA hospital. And that's a normally about a 45 minute trip. And I made that in about 17 minutes. Uh, so I was cooking. Uh, I broke every law on the road to get there. I showed up at the emergency room, told them what I had done. And then uh, they whisked me away to the emergency room. And you know, there's tubes and nodes and stomach pumping and it's all a blur. And then my folks are there. Uh, and then I'm getting pushed up to the, cause I voluntarily go into the sixth floor, which is, I guess the psych ward. Uh, and so I'm handcuffed to a bed my folks are next to me. They're watching me be wheeled off up the stairs. And, um, that was a tough, that was a tough run for me, but that, and that was absolute rock bottom. So while I'm sitting in this psych ward for, you know, four or five days doing puzzles and coloring, uh, cause that's what you do there. Uh, um, I saw a dude on the, on the TV. This is like November of 2014. And his name was Mike VD. He worked for, or he had started something called legacies alive. And he was walking one kilometer for each person that was killed in Iraq or Afghanistan since the 01 kickoff. And he had started in Washington state, gone all the way down to California, down to San Diego, hooked the big left and then walked across the country, hooked another left and then was coming up to Baltimore. And the reason that it was on the TV was because He's ending at the halftime for the Army Navy game, which is here in another couple of weeks. Mm. And man, that just spoke to me. And I was like, I have to do that. I got to go walk cross country. I got to go meet with my brothers. I got to go meet with the, the, the guys that are no longer here. I got to meet with their families. I got to tell them what I did. And I got I to gotta help myself and I got to help them. So that's really kind of how this all came about. I got out of the, I got out of the hospital. I was absolutely massive. I was 308 pounds. Um, I had let myself go. I was eating and drinking all my feelings and emotions. And I got on a mountain bike and I rode my mountain bike every day for 10 months. Just, it, just insane amounts of miles. Like at some points I'm doing 80 miles in a day, you know, waking up at 6 AM and just biking all day from Maryland down to DC, down to Virginia, and then back up and up to the Pennsylvania border and back down. I mean, it was, it was absolutely insane. Uh, but uh, yeah, 10 months later, I said, okay, I've gone from 308 pounds to 198 pounds. Now I can do this. And then, you know, that just so happened that the next few weeks after that was uh, shoring up to September 11th. And I was like, okay, that's the day I'll go. Wow. <laughs> that's yeah. a crazy story, man. Um, <clears throat> how did, how did you determine the route? 
I mean, being a Marine, I'm like, okay, wh what was your route card? How'd you figure out what you were going to do? I didn't, I didn't did you have one. The families? No, I didn't have one. And uh, I would just write on, I, so I started a Facebook probably for, because I got on Facebook like two years prior. I was like, I'm done with all that nonsense. <laughs> and so I got on Facebook and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. And I had kind of refriended all of the people that I served with and all my friends from, you know, past. Uh, and just told them what I was doing. And then guys started saying, well, hey, I live here. And hey, I live here. And so I'd plot the first couple. I'm like, oh, okay, you guys live here. So I'd walk the first route and get to him. And then be like, okay, where's the next guy? Okay, well, I'll walk to you and get to the next guy. And then over the course of time, people just kept dropping me their addresses. So as I was coming down uh, the Eastern seaboard towards Florida, more and more people were seeing it. And then after Florida, especially because Orlando Fox had, had done an interview with me, uh, that went, I guess it went pretty big. Um, and so it, more and more Marines had seen this and they're like, all right, I live here and I live here. So I, from then on, I could kind of sort of plot it. I would just plot it to the state. And then once I got into that state, I'd be like, all right, I'm in your state. Where are you? And then <laughs> kind of figure it out from there. Uh, so thank God nobody lived in Alaska. Um, cause this would have been a, this, well, I think actually one guy did, but he wasn't going to be around so I was like, well, thanks, man, because that just that just took, you know, 15,000 miles off my trip. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Shit, I'd probably um, still be walking. <laughs> yeah. Now, along, along the way, were you meeting uh, with Gold Star families? Yeah, the first one I met was uh, Dustin Schrag's mom and dad and uh, family. Uh, so the Schrag family down in uh, Satellite Beach area of uh, Florida, a little bit south of Daytona. And I had, uh, and then after that, I met with quite a few more in Florida because a lot of them live in Florida, but, uh, that was the first one. And I had, had called her probably, uh, I'd called Nina probably, I don't know, uh, two, three months prior and said, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this. And this is what I want to do. She was like, yeah, absolutely. Come on down. Uh, so we just made that happen. And then she's, she, Nina's actually the one that made that, uh, that very large newscast happen. Uh, and so from there, uh, more and more people started becoming aware of it. Yeah. So can you describe what that was like meeting with, you know, the gold star families? Yeah. It's always been a tough run for me because I know that they don't see me. Like I know that when they see me, they see someone that served with their son. I know they see their son and that's a really tough thing to get over and but you have to and so there were there were even a few times different gold star families would accidentally call me their son's name or something and uh i i knew then that it was healing because uh what i was doing uh for them was the same thing they were doing for me we were allowed to share in each other's grief and the happy moments and then create new memories and so every one that i went on was absolutely unique but there were some there were some semblances of uh, uh, of facsimile, if you will, right? There is still that idea that they probably don't see me, they see their son. Uh, and that was really, that was actually really neat to see because it also kind of gives them, uh, it might give them a little hope or it might give them uh, a little bit of closure or, or something, but it, it, it at least gives them the time to speak. And I wanted to do that. What did it do for you? I mean, I, I learned so quickly that I was, I was fortunate to be here and that, uh, those men all died for me to come home and that, uh, you know, had they not died, it probably would have been me. And, uh, so I never, I never take that for granted. And I think it gave me a new amount of determination to create a better life for myself because, you know, I'd want. I'd want to make them proud and I'd hope that, you know, if they could see me and they were looking at me, that they would be proud of me. Wow. Hey, great stopping point. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right. Back talking with Marine veteran, John Hancock on his 6,000 mile hump across the United States over like a year and three months, which is incredible in and of itself. So John, um, before the break, we were talking about some of the first couple of families you met and you know what that had done for them and, and, and what it had done for you. Um, what are some of the long-term lasting effects, you know, post post hump of 6,000 miles that have occurred 
before I before I started this walk, I had quit everything I had done since getting out of the Marine Corps. Right, I'd quit school, I'd quit every job I had had, I'd quit any any relationship, whatever it was. When it started to get difficult, uh, I quit it, and that was something that I didn't want to do again. And so, one, I completed this walk, and I decided very early on. I think I had a phone call with my mother uh, outside of Fort AP Hill in Virginia along Route 301. And, you know, I wanted to quit and she was like, well, you can, and I can come pick you up. You're only like three hours away. And I've been walking for two weeks and holy shit, that's really humbling. Uh, that, you know, so I couldn't, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, uh, give in to old me anymore. And so I decided that point because I was given that quit, I was given that out that I wouldn't take it. And then I just go until I'd emptied my gas tank. And it turns out that across the country and meeting with all these different people, it, it really revived me. And I think it helped them a lot too. And I really learned a lot about self accountability again, and not, you know, blaming things and, and using victimhood for some reason, uh, which I had done before. And so I didn't want to do that anymore. And that continues with me to this day. Uh, there's, you know, if you do something, you get to blame yourself for it. If you don't do something, you get to blame yourself for it. Uh, there's no one else that can take control of you other than you. And that was something that I had to relearn. Uh, and it was something that was long forgotten after getting out of the Marine Corps, where self-accountability is one of the most paramount things. Uh, and, and, and integrity and, and loyalty and those things that, you know, we base our entire life off of in the service, especially the Marine Corps. Uh, those were those fell by the wayside uh, as I got out and to uh, to get those back and to strengthen those again and then to. Uh, help show others that it's possible. That's, that's really the lasting effect. That's awesome. And so um, his name escapes me at the moment, but uh, uh, the guy who wrote the book Echo and Ramadi. Uh, Scott that, Husing. Yeah, that was 2-4 also. That was 2-4, but that was 2-4 in 2006. Was it? Uh, so okay. there's, yeah, so there's two different battles of Ramadi that we should probably, the listeners should probably know about. And uh, <clears throat> so the first one, 2004, was solely 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. Uh, so you're looking at, and we were understaffed at that point. Uh, and so I think we, you total of like actual warfighters, infantry, fire pissers is probably running in around 900 guys. Uh, and then of course you've got your support that probably equals out to about 1300, 1500, whatever that is. Now, even those support guys had gotten in some gunfights to tell you how bad that was. Right. Um, but then in 2006, uh, they realized just how much of a hornet's nest Ramadi was uh, from our deployment and then uh, subsequently from 2-5 uh, coming in to relieve us and then having a hell of a time as well. Uh, they realized that if they were ever really going to take Ramadi, they needed to have more than one battalion of Marines. Now, battalion of Marines can do anything they want, and they, we, we can accomplish any mission. We know we can. We've seen it happen. Uh, but if you want to truly uh, eradicate an enemy or make it safe there, we had to have a bigger a bigger force. And so it looked something akin, not necessarily as large as Fallujah in 2006, but uh, it did look uh, pretty large. I think there was quite a few battalions of Marines. Um, there was at least an army unit and then uh, a SEAL team or two and a recon team. Uh, so there was definitely more happening there in 2006 uh, on the good guy side of the house uh, <laughs> than we had in 2004. And so that was, that's a major delineation that we have to, we have to, you know, kind of provide. Yeah. And, you know, um, at the same time in 04 that all this stuff was going on in Ramadi, Fallujah one was happening. Right. Right. And that's also a, a huge saving grace for us because Fallujah was the massive thing. Right. And, uh, I think the powers that be, and I remember this happening, uh, Oliver North came out and gave a war stories on two, four. And, uh, after one, he, he was on a patrol with me, uh, we took some fire, we got in a gunfight, he was there filming the damn thing, um, which is insane. But, you know, I mean, Oliver North is, is probably one of the most uh, recognized and honored Marines uh, that's still around right now. Yeah. And uh, he, when he got back, he let us all use his cell phone or his sat phone. And uh, he had gone over and talked to, I guess, some of the leadership. And I had overheard them. I was a squad leader at the time, and I had overheard them. And they had said something to the effect of, we won't release this until you guys are deploying back home. Uh, we don't want to hurt you guys. And so I think what was happening is, is there was a cognizant media blackout about Ramadi because had, had Al Jazeera or Sky News or BBC been able to pick up any of this information, uh, and even the American stations, had they started reporting on it, 
I believe more and more fighters would realize that, hey, there's a lot less of a fight over in Ramadi, uh, and we could go over there and really decimate these guys worse than they've already been hit. And so I'm glad that that didn't happen. But the sad thing now is, is that as we speak about it, people go, well, I never even realized Ramadi was a thing. And it's, well, they, I mean, it's probably twofold. One, because Fallujah was happening. Two, because there was probably a media blackout. And now it's incumbent upon us to, you know, set the story straight and give you guys a real no shit look at what Smash Mouth Combat looked like for 900 guys. <laughs> well, at the time, Fallujah was essentially a city under siege. I mean, it had been locked down. Like, right. nobody was going in or out. <laughs> Kamadi was still open for the most part. I mean, the roads right. were still drivable and going in and out, even though it was it was a hornet's nest. But and of course, Ramadi and Fallujah are like next door to each other. They're not really. Oh yeah, they're apart. forty miles away from each other. They're two distinct cities, but they're they're part of the. You know, in many cases, yeah. would be two different suburbs in the same in the same uh, big city in the U.S. You know. Yeah, uh, it's probably it, it's basically like DFW. That's basically what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, we were talking before the interview, but I was a Cobra pilot at the same time you were there and I was at TQ Alpha Cotton, which is the airfield directly in the middle of Ramadi in Fallujah. So yep. we take and off you guys, and left and, and hit Ramadi, you take go turn right, you go to Fallujah. Yeah. And that was the, and before, and I, I really want to, I really want to shed some light on this story. Cause I know any of the two, four boys will, man, they'd love to hear this story, but it was July 21st, right? And 28th or the 28th, sorry. Yeah. And uh, we had, so we had come under a massive battalion level fight. Uh, Fox, Echo and Golf were all in a big fight around the city and it was in different points. And uh, Cobra, we finally got gunships because for April 6 through 10, we didn't have gunships, we didn't have Artie, we didn't have tanks, we didn't have any of it. Uh, and so that was also- it was a big, all in Fallujah. <laughs> right, it was all in Fallujah. And so that's why there's, that's a big factor as well of, as to why we, we took so many losses. Uh, but you guys were uh, Cobra pilots, and uh, we had a we had heard over the course of time that a Cobra pilot uh, who was providing uh, close air reconnaissance and support for us had been wounded, and then was killed in the cockpit of his Cobra. And when I got on the station with you this morning, uh, yeah. I found out that that was your Cobra. Yeah, I was the one. I was the one flying with him when he was killed that day. So. Well, I mean, what a coincidence, you know. Um, I've never actually talked to anybody that was on the ground since we, July twenty eighth, two thousand four. I never, I've never actually met anybody that was in person that was from two four. So yeah, uh, I can tell you at some at at one very critical point, we were in the middle of this. We were pinned down. We were shooting down this alley, and I don't know if it was your cobra. I don't know if it was your if it was another one of your gun team's cobras, but a cobra flew over scared the living shit out of these insurgents and they just went running and I lose all tactical bearing and just jump up and start screaming and shouting in the middle of the, sh in the middle of the street, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got to tell you guys, uh, you, you guys, you guys saved our lives that day, man. It, was, I, I it wasn't me specifically, but it was definitely somebody from our squadron. Right. Yeah. And that was awesome. And so. that's what, that's what, you know, that brings up a crazy story or, concept is we'd be sitting in the ready room and one of the pilots would be talking about a story about, yeah. And then we let the, you know, we rolled in on these guys. Right? And I'm like, w when did that happen? Uh, it was like two days ago. I'm like, there was so much happening and you're on, you're, we're on a 12, 14 hour shift and right. the other half, you know, guys at night are on a 12, 14 hour shift. There's so much happening. You don't even, you're not even able to keep up to speed on, what everybody else in the squadron you know, had happened to them or what they were doing. And there were yeah. just so many uh, crazy combat stories that we never, you know, I, to this day, I, I'm sure I still haven't even heard all of them. Um, but different times guys were shooting um, because it was just like, you didn't have time to sit around and talk about it because you're back out doing it again, you know? Um, right. Right. So that, that day that you know, Lieutenant Colonel David Green, um, which I believe he was, I was told he was the, the most senior Marine killed in the Iraq war at the time that that happened. Um, and uh, he was our maintenance officer for the squadron, but I was, I was flying in the front seat. He was in the back and he was the one doing the flying. And um, it was really like our fourth mission of the day. Cause in the morning, in the morning we had escorted some 46s into downtown Baghdad, the 31st cash to drop off some 
some uh, med- some med- uh, probably somebody that was injured or something like that. Sure. And then we came back, and then we were in the fuel pits refueling, and they said, "Hey, we need you to go out to the front gate and check something out." And there was a burning car out outside one of the front gates to TQ. Nothing really happened on that. So then we came back, went to the pits again, and we shut down, and then we got launched again because I'm assuming it was probably some guys from two, four, um, somebody we escorted some frogs into blue diamond yeah, LZ there in Ramadi, uh, picked up some casualties in the frogs and we were escorting them back. And it was, it was on the way back that the DAS called and said, Hey, we need, we need you guys to go back over out to Ramadi. So we let the frogs go and we turned around, went back. And then we were just supporting a patrol from two, four, um, all signed bastard on, on the east side of town and we went in and take a closer look and um, you know that's when we were when we were pulling off that's when we got stitched up the left side of the aircraft with about five rounds and um, one of the bullets hit right like to my, le- my left elbow but didn't penetrate the cockpit and then one hit Dave call sign Rhino in the back seat and uh one one of the rounds went into our main rotor blade. One of the rounds went into our left engine, dropped off our left engine. So I was kind of consumed with the fact that we had just lost our left engine and we needed to turn away. We need to turn away. Right. I eventually came on the controls and was pointing us away from the town. And and then I'm like, why why hasn't he said anything at this point? And then um, when I turned around, it was very obvious um, that he, he wasn't there. So I was able to limp back to uh, TQ on on the one engine and land, but. Um, he, n- he never said anything. It was, it was pretty much instant. So, um, I, uh, yeah, it's, uh, when I, when I knew you were coming on, uh, coming on the show and you're from two, four, I'm like, I wonder if he was there in Iraq, you know, four or so. Yeah, brother. I, I was, was definitely on the connection. ground that day. I was absolutely on the ground that day and you guys, you guys supported the hell out of us. So I can't thank you enough. And, yeah, uh, thank you, man. I- I can't wait to I can't wait to tell everyone from two four that I that I just met you and that like this like like I I've got the story guys like I know what happened. It's funny we, I, had, we had so many different rumors going around for years for yeah. years we've heard about this story and nobody could ever neck it down and then for me to be sitting on this podcast with you man I just come full circle this is amazing. Yeah, um, it was kind of interesting. It was kind of, I don't, it wasn't really necessarily intentionally kept quiet, but it just kind of stayed quiet. And then again, like I was saying earlier, there was so much stuff that still happened right on top of that, that it just got almost buried. But yeah. um, I, I remember reading some newspaper articles that had popped up back in the U.S., especially about Rhino and his hometown and all that. And and the la- one of the last lines of, of several articles was, his unidentified co-pilot returned safely to base. Yeah. So, like to me that was like significant because i'm like i'm the unidentified co-pilot right, right. which is fine I, it, but it just it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks i'm like uh, i guess i'm the unidentified co-pilot that reached right. the fleet of base um so yeah it's a um you definitely don't um you obviously talk about your experiences in iraq quite a bit um but did you ever come across that concept of how come guys don't ever talk about it? You ever hear, yeah. you hear that? And people told me that, and I'm like, I'm perfectly willing to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But here's the problem. I'm not going to talk about it at the cocktail party where it's some flippant question about, oh, what happened What happened in Iraq? And, and as I get part of the way into the story, something distracting happens at the party, and then no one's listening. Right. So I'll talk about it if I have a captive audience because mm-hmm. I don't want to be talking about it unless I know people are actually listening. Yeah. That's and I think, for me. I think that's probably also one of the reasons why a lot of guys don't talk about it is because maybe, maybe when, it, cause I know that's happened to me a few different times where, you know, I've started in on a story. Somebody's like, Oh yeah, cool story, dude. And then just walks away and I'm like, well, all right. Uh, it totally felt disrespected, not necessarily just sure. about you, but maybe about the guys you were telling the story about. Right, like, right, because it's not me. I don't give a shit about me. I give a shit about telling you about yeah. these guys that you're never going to meet. Right. And, like, yeah. it, that that hurt a lot more than anything else. So I was like, all right, screw it. So that's – I think that's that's probably a good reason why people go into holes. For me, that was always that was always why I don't talk about it. And it's not actually correct to say I don't talk about it because I will if anybody right. – 
if anybody's willing to listen, I'll tell the story, but I don't want to tell it in the wrong setting where there's lots of distraction going on and somebody stands the chance of disrespecting the story and disrespecting Rhino and everybody else that was involved. Yeah. Tell it unless yeah. people, I know people are listening. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I absolutely do that. And now I do it to the point where people, somebody will ask me a question and the dumb questions don't happen anymore, but every now and again, it's like, Hey, did you ever kill anybody? That question still comes out every now and again. <laughs> um, and so I say, all right, man, like, are you ready for the answer? Because it's going to take a while and you're not going to like the answer at all. But you've asked me the question. I'm totally able to answer it for you. Uh, but I need to know that you're going to sit here and listen to it. Right. And most of them are like, oh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to do that. Never mind. And I'm like, yeah, never mind. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, it's just most of the time they don't mean disrespect by it. But it's just sometimes right. we're a little sensitive about things, you know. <laughs> right. Well, especially about you know, brothers that never got to come home. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's one of the most sacred things. Absolutely. So, which has it, always been, it's always been tough for me to do that. But uh, I've yeah. also found that over the course of this walk, it gave me the opportunity and ability to talk more and more. And uh, as I was continually walking 30 miles a day with 70 pounds on my back, I'd want to talk to somebody. And then for weeks at a time, I wouldn't talk to anyone. And I'm like, huh, this sucks. And then when someone would pull over on the side of the road and be like, what are you doing? I would just word vomit. And, you know, it sounded, I sounded like a crazy person. But once I started tightening up the reasoning and I could get it out in like 30 seconds, like little elevator pitch, if you will, mm -hmm. that enticed enough people to like stay and ask more questions. And then that's when real conversations started to happen. And I was really telling my story about what I had experienced uh coming home and in combat and it just that was probably another thing that's really helped me is that now i'm one of these people that has the ability to talk uh and i can be an emissary for that absolutely hey john we're getting close to the end of our time um tell us a little bit about the movie the documentary bastards road yeah brother uh so bastards road is uh it's a <clears throat> it's an intimate look at my life as i take a walk across the country and walking you know 5807 miles from coast to coast and meeting with the guys that i served with in the gold star families it really tells their stories uh and it it shows the amount of community uh and love and loyalty that we have for each other as we continue to progress through life while we miss uh we miss our boys and while they're not here and how we overcome those feelings of tragedy uh and we gain solace in each other yeah Where's the easiest place to find the movie? I read off that list. It, it, it's pretty much anywhere you want to look, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, if you got a little, you got a little microphone on your thing, just say "Bastards Road" into it, and I'm pretty sure something will come up. If not, it's on TV uh, VOD or whatever TVOD. I think I always screw that up. It's on your cable on-demand stuff, yeah. and then uh, and then it's on iTunes, Google Play, Microsoft uh voodoo and fandango and a couple others that i don't know or can't remember uh but if you i mean you type in bastards road into your google machine you'll find it i promise you awesome hey marine it's great talking with you um thanks for sharing your story and that's a phenomenal journey that you went on so um i'm, I'm gonna i'm looking forward to watching the movie Hell yeah, brother. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, man. And let's keep in contact. Uh, I need to, Bet. I need to talk to you more. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Definitely. All right. All right. These two Marines are Oscar Mike.